the All Funds Investment Podcast explores those making investments in the alternative asset landscape, as well as the vendors who service these funds. We provide resources for emerging managers and insights for those in the alternative fund space. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Welcome to the All Fun Investment Podcast. It's Mike Schroeder. Today we're here with Kevin Cott of Cott Law Group. Kevin, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, to get started with the conversation, you mind just telling us a little bit about your background and uh, you know what prompted you to start uh, Cott Law Group? Um, certainly. So my background is um, went to Emory Law, graduated in 06. Um, I spent a few years at another investment funds practice here in Atlanta, which is where I'm based. Um, and then ultimately, uh, I've always been kind of entrepreneurial and, um, you know, I think as much or more so interested in running a small business um, along with practicing law. And so it was kind of always in the back of my mind. And at, at one point, I just decided to take the jump and um, started my own firm back in 2011. So it's been about 11 years building up the practice and, and just specializing in the investment fund space. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about, you know, your, your company, what you guys do and uh, the services that you offer. Yeah. So we're a boutique law firm, again, based in Atlanta. We specialize in working with investment funds and advisors. That's, that's really our, our core practice. Um, we work with, you know, everything from startup and emerging managers to really larger institutional fund clients and across all asset classes. Um, so we work with, you know, traditional hedge funds, you know, sort of plain vanilla long short funds, um, all types of, of hedge funds, commodity pools, uh, private equity, venture capital fund clients, uh, real estate funds. Um, and then we've developed particular expertise working with digital assets and, and crypto fund managers. Um, that's become one of the larger parts of our practice. And I think we've, you know, established ourselves as one of the preeminent firms in the country for that kind of work. Um, and then we also, you know, provide sort of ongoing support for our clients, um, you know, whether it's regulatory, um, kind of working with compliance and, and just making sure that we can assist fund managers through the entire life cycle. Got it. And in, in terms of, you know, ongoing work, kind of what, what does that side look like? It really depends, right? Because you've got the sort of self-sufficient fund managers, maybe an emerging manager that really just needs the legal help to get everything structured up front, launched, and then from there, it's, it's really most of the work is done by their fund admin and, and maybe if they have like outsourced compliance. For them, you know, if they're not changing much to the structure or, or you know, bringing in, you know, bolting on an offshore feeder or really doing much um, sort of legal substantive work, then there's not much to do. It's, you know, we help with the Form D annual amendments if they need us to do that, blue sky filings. Um, we can update the offering documents to, you know, address, um, you know, regulatory updates and, and things of that nature. Um, and then there's the other clients that, that are really evolving. Um, you know, maybe they start with a single fund with us and then they want to launch a venture arm or they, they want to bring in um, non-US and tax exempt US investors and we'll help them launch an offshore feeder or they have an institutional investor need help uh, negotiating a side letter. Um, obviously we like those clients that, that have a lot of ongoing work, but, but we work with both. It, it just really depends on the client's needs. Got it. Now, when it comes to setting up a fund, well, you know, I guess we'll kind of zoom in on crypto funds here, but yeah. what are some of the key factors to consider when it comes to setting up a fund? Yeah. I, so I get this question a lot. I think, um, you know, you can get caught up in the legal minutia of structuring, but I, I think if you zoom out, the, the big thing to realize is that, you know, it, it's still a business. So strategy and performance is your product, but it all, and it all starts there, but ultimately you're running a business. So you really want to be mindful of what's your business plan, you know, what's your budget, you know, who are your partners, you know, who are your partners or are you, you know, partnering with someone whom you can trust and, and have a long-term relationship with, like as with any business, um, how do you intend to raise capital and scale? Um, I just think really hammering home the fact that you need to approach it like any other business and actually have like a concrete plan in place that's actionable. Um, it's probably the first piece of advice. Um, other things to think about are, are choosing service providers. Um, I'm obviously a little bit biased, but it, it, you know, often starts with legal. And so really invest the time to interview and, and talk to multiple providers, you know, different, whether it's, you know, boutique, large law firms, 
but specialists that know, understand the space and, and find the one that's the right fit for you and can grow with you. You know, and the same goes for admin audit. But a lot of what we see a lot of times is fund managers, is fund managers that try to kind of skip a step or take a shortcut. You know, or worked with sort of like a, you know, turnkey kind of all in one. And and sometimes what what happens is you know they can save a little bit of money up front, or they they get they can skip a step, but then they almost always, if they're successful and growing, have to go back and fix it, and it's more trouble than it's worth. So I think just being mindful of who whom your providers are up front um, is huge. Awesome. Um, now, when it comes to um, considering an offshore structure. What are, uh, you know, when, when should a fund be looking at something like that? Yeah, so it, it's, it's usually pretty black and white. So you've got U.S. taxable investors want a U.S. fund. Um, Non-U.S. investors generally want an offshore vehicle. Tax-exempt U.S. investors, if, if you're you know, using any leverage or um, would trigger what's called UBTI, will want an offshore fund. And so it, it really depends kind of first and foremost on your investor base. So if you have that, you know, non-U.S. tax-exempt group of investors, um, typically they would want some kind of offshore vehicle that, that can be a corporate blocker. Um, so that's kind of number one. And then number two is, um, you know, how many of the, those investors are there? So is there enough? Can you raise enough capital to justify the ongoing, the additional expense, you know, of, of adding a Cayman or a BBI fund and potentially a master fund? You know, it, it's... I would equate it to on the domestic level, can you raise enough capital to justify launching a full fund versus just an incubator? And so on the offshore side, just making sure that, that you're not doing it just, just to have the option, but because you can, you can actually um, raise enough capital to justify it. Yeah, and, and you, you highlighted Cayman and BVI. Could, could you highlight like some of the differences that you, know, you might consider you know, when choosing? Why, why would you go with BVI versus Cayman or what does that look like? Yeah, so so both are really um, excellent jurisdictions. It's they're the predominant ones we see with most all of our um, offshore fund uh, clients. Um, I think for a long time, Cayman was the preeminent jurisdiction, um, and it still sort of has like a legacy holding there, where where some maybe like older school investors will prefer it. Um, yeah, it's like Delaware. Yeah, exactly. And so that can that can certainly drive your decision if you have a large investor that says they want a Cayman fund, you're going to use a Cayman fund. Um, BVI, I think from a sophistication standpoint, you know, is equal. Um, and we see more and more funds using BVI vehicles as well. Um, especially on the crypto side, there seems to be sort of like more open-minded, um, a little more open-minded with respect to using a BVI vehicle, but I think both are really good options. Um, probably a, a better question for offshore council. Um, but, but we see both and, and don't have a problem with either. Awesome. And not, not to just keep drilling you on these, but yeah. could you talk to us about a mini master versus a master feeder fund and, and some of the differences there? Yeah. And, and just to, I guess another point I just thought about with the Cayman versus BVI. So there's the trade off of, you know, Cayman's a little bit more um, prominent, um, but it's also slightly more costly. I think the annual fees are a little bit more. Uh, you have to have like the the local audit sign off. Um, so it's really just kind of understanding, you know, you can get the weeds of of the difference in the filing fees and um, local regulatory requirements. But um, I think just kind of evaluating that trade off. But then, um, yeah, mini master versus master feeder, you said? Yeah. Um, so it depends. We see both. Um, let's say you're a U.S. fund manager. You start with a domestic fund. You know, you start getting traction. Um, an interest from non-U.S. investors or tax-exempt U.S. investors, and they want to invest in your fund as well. Probably what makes the most sense in most situations is to bolt on an offshore feeder um, and just have a mini master structure where that Cayman or BVI company serves as a corporation, invests directly in the U.S. fund as an LP, but it's also a corporate blocker. And then you still just continue to trade through the, the U.S. master fund. Um, you know, it's very efficient, um, can provide some, you know, administrative efficiencies in trading, um, and just operations. Um, occasionally you'll see it where, where that you actually want to expand that to a full master feeder. And so you have the U S feeder, the offshore feeder, and then they pull their assets in a third vehicle. That's typically also mm -hmm. offshore and is a pass through vehicle for us investors. Um, but the, 
the the non-US and tax exempt US investors or the non-US and tax exempt US investors are still in that offshore blocker. So everyone's accommodated. Um, there's a million reasons you might see that your non-US investors may just prefer it. They, they for whatever reason, don't want to even you know touch the US through um, the US fund. Um, you know, you may be a crypto or digital assets fund manager that, that needs that. Um, you want to invest through an offshore vehicle for a variety of reasons. Um, or, or sometimes it's just the fact that that was the traditional structure for a long period of time and is sort of like uh, the more complex um, option that if, you know, if you're okay with spending the additional fees on the second offshore vehicle, um, it provides you the most flexibility. Yeah. That, that makes sense. And you did mention like U.S. funds wanting to trade with like some of these offshore exchanges. I know I've definitely talked to a lot of crypto funds that, you know, maybe maybe somebody like me based in the U.S. that wants to trade on, you know, whether it's Binance or, you know, one of these offshore exchanges. Maybe they want the, uh, you know, perpetuals, things like that. What is, uh, you know, can you talk about some of the ways that you guys can help by structuring those vehicles? Yeah, so that's probably the number one question we get right now from our, our digital assets and crypto fund clients. You know, they want to access these off non-US exchanges like FTX and, and Binance and, um, you know, all, all the ones that are out there. Um, you know, there's, there's more, uh, you can use a little bit more leverage and, and trade certain crypto derivatives. Um, and it's challenging so that, you know, a lot of these exchanges, they don't want to... Um, they will not allow U.S. investors, um, due to CFTC uh, requirements, they don't want to register as a as a FCM um, for good reason. And so, it you know in the past um, they've kind of continued to their their due diligence has evolved over the years. And, and whereas in the past there were some funds that maybe just got in through an offshore vehicle and were grandfathered in, um, a lot of times now that that's not going to comply with the terms and conditions. Um, of the exchange, and obviously you want to make sure that you don't misrepresent anything on those um, applications. That's that's where you can get in trouble and have serious liability. Um, and so the the question is, how can you access those exchanges if you you know are based in the U.S. and have U.S. investors um, without violating the terms and conditions of of those exchanges? Um, one thing that we've seen um, arise is is sort of a debt financing arrangement with a a, a non-US trading vehicle. Um, so what you're doing is, is the, the fund doesn't own it. It's got its own independent directors, um, traders, um, and the fund loans capital to it. Um, and then just receive, you know, it's either um, like a credit facility or, or maybe there's a call option and you have to you have to be mindful of structuring it with tax to make sure it works. Um, but by doing so, because it's debt and, and not equity, um, you can potentially uh, access these exchanges while not violating terms and conditions you know the caveat with all this yeah. is it's a, it's an evolving kind of very complex um subject and and you, you definitely want to you know there's not one all-in-one solution so it really depends on the specific exchange the spe specific specific client how they're trading but that it's usually some variation of that that we're seeing a lot of yeah is there i mean with, with structuring with the with with debt like that is there you know potential like personal liabilities or you know, anything like that? Um, I, with with respect to the fund or, or the there, there's yeah, like you know, investment manager they start with five million dollars. Yeah, you know, they, they set up this debt structure. Now there's only four million dollars in the fund. So you know, is that is the fund manager on the hook for that? No, I mean they, they should still have the same you know, absent fraud or something that pierces the corporate veil. Like they should have the same protections of you know, the fund manager is a limited liability company. They only have limited liability. Um, so I, I think as long as you're not, you know, engaging in fraud, it's just, it's just a loan that, that shouldn't trigger personal liability. Um, but again, case by case. Yeah, no good stuff. I, I think a lot of people will find that information helpful. Yeah. Uh, what, what does the competitive landscape look like on the legal side and how do you guys account differentiate yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, like any industry, it's competitive. Um, what you see is I think a lot of different service providers um, of, of different uh, sort of levels of service. So there's, you know, sort of um, general practices that dabble in the space. There's specialists like us that are, you know, boutique firms really dedicated to investment funds work. 
Um, there's larger law firms with really um, you know, sophisticated, experienced investment funds practices. Um, I, I think our mission from the start is to really position ourselves as a top tier boutique. Um, I think that for, for the majority of managers is the best of both worlds where you've got really high end, sophisticated, experienced investment funds counsel that can you know, compete with some of the larger firms in the country, but you're packaging it in a boutique. So let, you know, if, if um, you know, for most managers, you know, more competitive pricing, more responsiveness is, is a good thing. Um, there's certain, you know, really high profile, large launches that, that need um, the services of a really large law firm, um, you know, substantively and also for, for optics and marketing. Um, but for the rest of the fund managers out there, I think we're a really good fit. Awesome. How do you think about uh, compliance as a lawyer? And, yeah. you know, I kind of I kind of ask that in terms of like, you know, overlapping with like CCO, you know, I mean, a lot of these funds love to file, you know, like you mentioned, like Blue Sky, ADV, you know, kind of keep a general question about how, how do you look at compliance to lawyer? So we look at it as maybe we're there if you need us. So we're, we're you know, support. So ideally, you, you know, you get clients to a point where they've got their own CCO or they've got an outsourced compliance solution. We're not looking to compete with them. We're really focused on the investment funds work. Um, you know, but but we do handle Form D filings and Blue Sky filings and, and obviously initial uh, investment advisor registrations and exempt reporting advisor filings. Um, for a lot of funds, fund clients, you know, they, they really want to kind of handle that all in one shop at the start. And then maybe they grow to a size or, or eventually bring on compliance. Um, so we, we sort of support whatever they need. Um, but, but we work with a lot of outsourced compliance firms. Um, we refer work to them. Our goal is to really focus on the investment funds work and have a compliance specialist come in at some point. But, um, you know, we have the, the capability to help with that as needed. Yeah, good stuff. And uh, in terms, are, are, is there any projects you guys are working on right now? Any, anything that, you know, you guys are really seeing in the market, you know, fund types, things like that? Yeah, so I mean, still, we're, we're still very, um, so we, we did our first crypto fund back in 2016. Um, we were just interested in the space, spent a lot of time and energy learning the asset class, um, and, and it very quickly as it kind of, um, you know, exploded in, 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 uh, interest, um, yeah. yeah, it became, became a core part of our practice and, and really something where we separate ourselves from some of the other law firms out there. So we've, it's funny, it's, it's kind of, um, ebbed and flowed with the, the price of crypto. So from 2016 to 2018, we were, you know, slammed with crypto funds work. And then, um, you know, it sort of tailed off and for about a year and a half. And then I would say summer of 2020, it picked right back up and, and it's been nonstop. And so um, I would say we're still seeing a lot of really interesting uh, like blockchain venture funds, um, you know, crypto funds along the lines of, of the funds we were talking about earlier, where you're trying to access non-US exchanges and how do you navigate, um, you know, the regulatory requirements around that. Um, but that's, that's what we're seeing a lot of. I, I think the venture funds are really interesting. Um, but just, you know, basically anything and everything under the sun uh, in connection with digital assets is what we're, we're seeing a lot of right now. Yeah, a lot, a lot of funds out there. Yeah. Um, w what advice would you give to somebody that's, you know, new fund manager entering the market? Uh, what type of advice would you give them? Um, I think be realistic about budget and, and ability to raise capital. Um, you know, kind of along the lines we talked about earlier about having a real business plan and, and aligning yourselves with the right service, yourself with the right service providers. Um, you know, if you're on the fence, one thing I always try to tell startup managers is, is you can start with an incubator, um, and kind of dip your toe, you know, get a more um, marketable track record. Um, and if, if, the performance is there, then, then build it into a fund. Um, that's probably number one. Um, and, and you know, beyond that, just really thinking of it as a business and being really thoughtful um, about structuring up front before you dive in. Awesome. Kevin, uh, this has been great. Thank you so much. Where could people go to learn more about Cot Law, Law Group and to connect with you? Definitely. Yeah. Um, so they can find everything about us on our website. It's uh, www.cotlawgroup.com. That's C-O-T-T-L-A-W-G-R-O-U-P.com. Um, my bio, our team's bio, respective bios, um, our practice areas, it's all on there, um, as well as uh, information to contact us. 
um, my person or my email address and, and number and our contact number on the website. Um, so if, if anyone is interested and has any questions for us, um, I would encourage them to check it out. Um, but yeah, I, I appreciate you having me on. This was, uh, this was fun. I'm glad you're doing it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll include that in the show notes and, uh, yeah, definitely check out Kevin and, uh, Kyle Logger if you guys get the chance. All right. Thanks, Mike. Have a great afternoon.